So we can be with somebody physically in our bodies, but our minds are not with us, not, not there. And sometimes, sometimes we are like that with God as well, where we are with him physically, but are, we're not there with him. Um, so I want to talk about how to be present, not perfect, how to be present, how to take all of us in that space with him. And some of the things that stops us from being present to when we're present with somebody, when they're talking to us, we're doing eye contact. We are engaged with our, not only our eyes, but our body is engaged to our facial expression is engaged and everything is present there with them and they know that I have your full attention. You know, when you're talking to a child, when, when my children were smaller and I'm talking to them, if I'm not looking, my son used to do this and he used to turn my face in his direction because he wanted my full attention. And that's what God wants from us and that's what we want from him. But there's sometimes things that happen to us in life that stops us from being fully there. Like we're here now and our attention span is not that, is not that great, is it? Our attention span, we will be here and then we'll wander off and then we come back and we think about stuff at lunch and we wonder if we turn the oven off and then another thought will intrude and another thought will intrude and another thought will intrude. And it's how do we stop those intrusive thoughts from bombarding us when we're doing something um, so that we can be fully there? I know social media and the world don't train us to be present and have long attention spans. Like I, I blog, I write, and uh, I was watching a, a broadcast that says, so the, most of the blogs on my website are like 1,200 words, and they're saying, well, don't write them 1,200 words anymore because nobody's reading them. Um, videos are a couple seconds, and you know everything is different. Everything is different, and, and it's tricking our brains and telling us that we can't focus. And then we go in God's presence, and if we're used to that, it's the same thing we take into the, his presence with him. So how can we train ourselves? And what are the things that stops us from, from receiving our blessing? Because I think that's the enemy's plan, that we're not, we can, we can go in and out and not benefit from the time that we're there with him. So sometimes the challenges that we have before God is, our, our, as I said, our bodies are there, but our minds are not there. There's a quote that I absolutely love. And it's from the Desire of Ages, page 363, that says, when every other voice is hushed and in quietness we wait before him, the silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. So we have to be fully there. What does it mean that our souls are silent? What does it mean when your soul is silent? Have you ever experienced that? So one of the things I love to do is sit in silence. I love silence. But I'm an introvert, so that works for me. Um, my favorite thing to do when I'm stressed or when I'm tired, when I've had a long week or a long day, we live near the sea. So going and watching the waves just go out and in is just one of the most peaceful and restorative things for me. Or just lying in my room, turn off the light on my back and just stay there. I can stay in silence for ages, for two hours or more. I can make myself leave. So it's that kind of when everything else is hushed, when everything else is quiet, that's when we get to hear the voice of God. And who wants to hear him? Put your hand up or put one in the chat or something. Do you, do you like when he tells you things, when he communicates with you, when you, when, he, when you know that was him that says, do that and you do it? How it, it, it's, it's, an, it's exciting, isn't it? It's amazing when you think, God, you created the world and you're actually talking to me. But if we're not present, we're going to miss those promptings that he gives us. We're not going to know whose voice it is because we're not practicing hearing him because we are not. The noise that's going on in the background drown out his voice and we can't hear him. So that's why it's important. So I want you to know, if you look at your worksheet now, there is a question that says, what does it mean to you to be fully present? If somebody, you can, you can say it or you can put it in just for your benefit if you don't want to share. What does it mean to be fully present to you? If, if, um, if I'm talking to you and you say, Joanna, you're not, you're not present, what would that mean to you? What does it mean to be fully present? 
when somebody's fully present with you, what does it mean? Tell us in the chat if you're happy to tell us, or you can just unmute and say it. What does that mean when somebody's undivided? You have somebody's undivided attention, yes, and we all love that. Somebody's undivided attention. Like, I want your undivided attention tonight. So, actively listening, yes, so they're, they're talking back, so you know that they're hearing you. Thank you. Anybody else? Alice, you have your mic off? Was it Alice had their mic off? He cares, right? Eye contact, yeah, that's important. So when somebody's present, all of those things are happening, yes? Thank you. Have you ever experienced somebody's talking to you, but your mind is doing something else? Like you're going, mm -hmm, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 they finish and, and you go, and they expect a response and, and you go, can you repeat that again? Can you repeat the last part? Because I, did, I didn't hear you. Um, and then they know. And sometimes people don't repeat the last part. Or like if my husband's talking to me and I'm on social media, I'm responding to something and, and he's saying something to me and I'm, and I'm just going, mm, 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 -hmm, mm, -hmm, mm, -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and he, he looks at me like, you're not listening, are you? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, honey, I'm sorry. Can you, can you say that again? Um, and, and I'm guilty. I'm guilty of that because I spent I spent so much time on there responding to people, answering questions, communicating, posting, doing all that kind of stuff. And so he comes home from work and he's trying to have a conversation with me. And he has the most amazing voice. I, and uh, but I can't. I don't hear. And he goes, "You didn't hear, did you?" Or or we're reading together at night, and he's reading, and I and I fall asleep. <laughs> You're not listening. You're not listening. I said, but your voice is so nice. But when you're reading, I fall asleep. So, but when people are communicating with us, they want us to be all there. They want your full attention. They want us to be all there. And when we when we learn and can practice how to do that, that's where we benefit most from our time with God. When I was just learning how to sit in silence, when I started training and was learning how to sit in silence, that thing was hard. Okay. Because I'm type A. I'm always doing something. My mind is going. I am planning the next thing, talking about the next thing, writing about the next thing. I'm doing the next thing. Um, so when I had to learn how to sit and quiet, not just my mind, but my body, that took work. But I realized that when I quiet, when I learned how to quiet my mind and my body, that's when I learned, that's when I heard so much more than what was said. I learned so much more. I heard so much more. So if you can learn that skill, it's going to be so effective. You're going to get so much more out of your connection time, out of your devotional time, out of the time that you spend in prayer. It's going to be sweeter as you learn how to quiet your mind and your body. So some of the things that, that present mean is being present is also going without an agenda. Going without an agenda makes us be present. Because if we go to God and we have our own agenda, we have an idea about how we want him to answer our prayers and the things we want him to do. So those things will take up our thoughts and take precedence. And we won't be able to really hear his agenda because we, ha we have our own. One day I went with my own agenda and I was complaining about one of the children. And I was going, God, and, and he's this and this and this and this. And he says to me, he says, you know, Joanna, in those moments when you want them to give you their heart, I don't have yours. And you, with an unsurrendered heart, want somebody to surrender their heart to you. That was just like, what? You know, so he tells you the truth. And, you know, the word of God is sharp and it's powerful and it cuts. Like, surrender to me in those moments when you want them to surrender to you and you will begin to see a difference. And I'm telling you, that's been a game changer in my parenting. Like, in those moments when I'm upset, when nothing's going well, surrender, Joanna. That's when you surrender. You don't have a nice speech. You don't, you're not thinking of, nobody's going on timeout. Nobody's doing anything because you are surrendering so that I can tell you what to do. So when we're, when we're present, we're going without our own agenda. 
And we're showing up to learn. We're not going just to do the talking. We're also going to hear, to do the listening. To um, Have you ever prayed? And after you finish praying, you stay there on your knees just to hear what he has to tell you, what God has to say. Try it if you've never tried it. Just stay there. If, you know, do as long as you can. If it's five minutes, do five minutes. But just practice stillness there on your knees. Or Mary said she has. And I, and I hope, I'm sure it's been a blessing to you, Mary. And also, when you, when you, yeah, when you pray or just a, a prayer that's on your knees, no words. Sometimes, sometimes life can hit us so hard. And I've spent like an hour on my knees, not being able to say anything because I'm in so much pain, not physical pain. But I didn't have any words. And so that's how I communicated. And before I left my knees, I felt better because God understood those words. And the, the, in Romans, I think it's Romans chapter eight, that says that the Holy Spirit presents our prayers with groanings that cannot be uttered. So that day, he told my prayer to the Father through Jesus and God heard an answer. Um, when we are fully present, we are there to learn whatever he has to teach us. So we don't have our own agenda. We're just going to learn. What should I do? And we're prepared for the answer to be different to the one that we think we should have. What should I do? Where should I live? Should I apply for that job? Is this the right relationship? Should I respond to this message? What should I do? You know, be prepared for him to speak to us. Um, and when we go present, we're not telling him, we're just going to hear and to learn from him. But sometimes our thoughts stops us from hearing what God has to say to us. Our thoughts, and not only our thoughts, but what, you know, the uproar that's going on in our bodies when our bodies are not relaxed. So the quote I just read that says, when every other voice is hushed, and the voices are not outside voices only. It's the ones that we have internally as well. Those many thoughts that we have swirling around our minds, the many things that we have planned, the things that we're worrying about, the things that concerns us, all of those thoughts also need to be brought into subjection to the obedience of Christ so that we can hear him. And I know that our thoughts are many sometimes, there are thousands that we think every day. We have recurring, repetitive thoughts. We have negative automatic thoughts. We all have them. But tonight, hopefully, some of the things that we learn will help us to be able to manage them in a way that we can fully hear him. So the next thing that you have to do, there's some other lines. Is, have you ever struggled to control your thoughts and to bring them with you to worship? Have you ever struggled to bring your thoughts with you to worship? Have you ever struggled to bring your thoughts with you? Like you're, you're in church, you're in worship, but your thoughts are shopping, they're having a conversation, they're watching a movie, they're playing football, golf. Have you ever there, but your thoughts are completely somewhere else? This is a no judgment zone. So we're not asking so that, you know, you can feel anyway. We're just trying to get what the, the real thing is. So the next one is, what do you think the following verse means when it says every thought? And it's the Second Corinthians 10 and verse 5. You can find that. Thank you for those responding. Thank you. Second Corinthians 10 verse 5 gives us some instructions about what we can do if we're there and our thoughts are not fully there. Second Corinthians 10 and verse 5. I absolutely love this verse. Let me know when you found it and we will we will read it. I'm going to find it on my phone. Let me know when you found it. It's 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. It should be on your, your paper that you have. Are you there? It says, casting down imaginations and e every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God 
and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. Now, has anybody ever, do you know how to pray through scripture? Do you ever pray through scripture? Like something's going on and you find a scripture that's appropriate and you pray through that scripture. Like using those words as your prayer. You do? Great. I love to do that because then I don't have to find my own words. So when you're learning how to cast down everything, every thought to the obedience of Christ. So if you're there and your thoughts are running arise, going all over the place, if you take a few moments just to breathe and to pray through this prayer, Lord, I want every thought to be in obedience with you, every single one. Tell him what, exactly what your thoughts are doing, because he knows anyway. So um, sometimes shame stops us from doing this kind of work and be as honest with him. But every thought, what are the thoughts? Good, bad, not so wonderful, whatever the thoughts are. God, I'm struggling with jealousy right now. I am very angry because I'm upset. I feel this way because of this thing. And every thought into the obedience of Christ. If you have recurring negative thoughts, they're subtle, they repeat, bring those into subjection too. Say, can you, can you just hold these thoughts so that I can worship and be fully here with you? These are the thoughts. This is why they come. You know, this is what they are. When I was doing the getting ready to go to Portugal to speak, and I was saying God says to be still, negative. You are not like Abraham. You don't have enough faith. You are, you took too long. You were not, you were too busy. You didn't act quickly enough. Those negative thoughts that comes, there's a quote in, there's not, no, great controversy, I think it's page 516 that says, I'm, I'm going to have to paraphrase that, we, we um, guard and protect our homes with locks and bolts, but we don't protect our minds from the, the enemy. Scarcely, she said, do we believe the enemy that the thoughts that comes and bombard us, especially when we're in prayer, they're not yours. And when I say this to people, they struggle to say, but, but yes, they are mine, but they're not yours. They didn't originate with you. They didn't come from you. They're suggestions that are, are things that you need to think about. You know, uh, is it, have you ever wondered why the past just comes up so conveniently when you go to worship or when you go to pray? Or the pastor can say something and it trigger a song that you used to sing 20, 30 years ago. And you find yourself singing the song and you're missing half of the sermon because that song has taken over. Those are the kind of thoughts that need to be brought into subjection to the obedience of Christ. Even the thoughts about the pain, even the thoughts, and sometimes the events might be very real, might be very real, like your boss, your partner. Your friend might just finish telling you that you're not good enough, that you are what, 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 that, you know, the negative words that happen, it might just happen. But those thoughts also need to be brought into subjection of Christ because they're usually not true. And they wouldn't pass the test in Philippians 4 verse, Philippians 4 verse 8, whatsoever, or is it 19, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are true. So that's why those thoughts need to be, I, I like to say, use that as a sift to sift your thoughts through. Philippians 4. Are they true? Are they honest? Are they just? Are they right? Are they good? When we have, the, the way we think impacts how we feel and impacts how we act. So if the thought is, why are you even here? God's not hearing you. If the thought is, you did that thing this week and you're here pretending to worship. If the thoughts are, you just told off so-and-so, or where were you last night? That movie that you watched, that conversation that you just had, you're a gossip and you know it. Why are you pretending to sing I Surrender All? 
why are you saying amen to the sermon when you know what you're going to do after this? You've planned it. Those thoughts come at convenient times. And those thoughts also need to be sifted through Philippians 4 and need to be brought into subjection of Christ. And what does that mean to be bringing them into subjection? What does it mean? It means that you didn't originate them. You didn't think them up. God didn't give them to you. And it means that they need to stand still. They need to obey. They need to be quarantined so that you can have peace and space to worship. So God can instruct you and tell you how to deal with gossip next time somebody comes to talk to you about it. So that God can instruct you about what to do about those negative words that this person keeps telling you over and over. This relationship. How am I going to the repair work to doing it so that those thoughts about your past, the mistakes that you've made, God can help you to put them in perspective. But when you show up thinking that you need you need to fix all of that first before you can come and be fully there, then you miss what he wants to tell you about yourself. And he has the truth about you. He has the truth about you. The truth about you is not the negative messages that you've heard. The truth about you is not the negative things that people say to you. The truth about you is not even some of our experiences that we've had. That's not true either. Because sometimes when we've experienced childhood trauma, especially, and when we grew up in certain circumstances, we have structures, thought structures that are negative, that are, um, that are harmful and dam damaging and toxic. And we have those swirling around in our minds because of painful past learning, because of our history, because of the traumas that we've experienced, because of the very real realities that we live. Those thoughts come and they bombard us at times when we need to go here so God can say to you, you know what, Joanna, you may have grown up poor. You may have experienced this. You may have experienced this one. However, however, this is who you are today. And I want you to focus on that. I want you to focus on who you are today. I want you to focus on the things that are possible through me. I want you to know that I am the potter. And I want you to know that I can remake you. I want you to know that. In Joel chapter 2, he promised that he's going to restore the years of the palmer worm and the canker worm, the years that the locust has eaten. He says he will restore it. And we, we read stories of the people who move from homeless to whatever, you know? We hear those stories. We hear those stories of people who have experienced full restoration. We know that it's possible that he can do it for us too. But we need to go with Space to hear. We need the space. We need capacity to hear it. But when our thoughts are full and our minds are full, and oftentimes when we're triggered, we're in the presence of God or wherever we are, or we're triggered. When we're triggered, our minds go in the emotional brain. And that time, our frontal lobe, where we do our reasoning and our thinking, where we are logical, where we make decisions, that goes offline. That means we can't hear a thing. So can you imagine being in church, in worship, in session tonight, in service, trying to read your Bible, trying to have devotions, and you're triggered? Some painful past learning came up. And it happens to all of us. We all have it. Events that have an emotional connection get stores in the brain. It's in our emotional center of the brain. When we're triggered, and it takes milliseconds to move from trigger to automatic response. So you're triggered and before you know it, you're, you're, you're there and you're there. The song is being sung and you say, you say it because you know what to say, but you're not present because you're back there. And when we're triggered, we're experiencing the event, the body, the, the, the brain and the nervous system, the whole body, our whole being is experiencing this thing as if it's happening right now. So I'm afraid of dogs because I was bitten. I was chased and bitten, and I, the, the dog could be as tiny as ever. It still elicits the same response. I'm working on it. So when I see one, that's it. That's it. I'm not rational. I'm like, it takes me ages to come back to myself and go, Joanna, breathe, breathe, breathe. Remember deep breathing because this dog is tiny. 
it can't do you anything. Control yourself. But it takes a while, and I know what to do. So when you're there, if you're there and something is happening, a simple activity as deep breathing helps to soothe the emotional brain, the parasympathetic system, and give you back access to your frontal lobe so you can go, I need to bring every thought into obedience of Christ. God, control these thoughts for me. You quarantine them so that I can hear you because I want to hear you. I want to be present. So it's not get all of the sticks so that you can do it because, and this, this, this process takes seconds. So you're triggered, your mind is gone, you're not here, you're not with us. Deep breathing. And, and, that, and that's a, such a simple activity, just like two deep breaths or three sharp deep breaths. Don't make it, sometimes if we're triggered and we're anxious, if it's like, that might make you more anxious. So if it's slow and let oxygen in and release it slowly, when we're triggered, our muscles, our bodies are also, you know, our bodies will respond as well. So sometimes our shoulders are stiff, we have brain fog, our tummy's rumbling, you know, different things are going on, our chest is tight. As we deep breathe, the, the, the muscles have to release and relax. It has to. And there's an activity that I do that mostly do this in retreats, and you can do it with yourself. Think about if you're stressed, and your, your, your shoulders are knotted. And say your shoulders are not, and you can always feel when your shoulders are knotted. If you press down on the knot and inhale, and exhale and release, press down and inhale and exhale and release, after a while, the knot has to release because just that activity of inhaling and exhaling helps to release the knot in your shoulders. Our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made. And it was made, the mind and the body was made to cooperate with each other. So those are some things that you can do. And nobody around you needs to know that it's going on, even if you're in the public. If you're at home alone, wherever you are, and you just take time and deep breathe, it soothes the, 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 the hot system of the brain, gives you back access to your frontal lobe, where you can say, God, take these thoughts into captivity, because I can't hear a word. And I want to hear. And I want to hear you. And I want to connect with you today. Take the painful past learning. Take the painful past. Take the painful memories. Take the things, the thoughts that I'm bombarded and are coming in at this time and is stopping me from being fully present and fully hearing you. Okay. So those just, you know, one one simple thing to do that is very effective that helps to relax us. Right. Okay, so I'm going to let you do that one, how you use the verse when you are, when your thoughts are distracting you while you worship. So how do we, what, how do we become fully present? We become fully present when we can let go of, while we're there, the shame of the thing that we've done, the mistake that we made, the thoughts around the mistake, telling you that you said you're not going to do it and you've done it again. You said you were going to change, but here you are praying about the same thing. There's a song that the heritage singers used to sing many years ago that I still love that says, here I am again, I'm on my knees again, um, cry, I'm praying one more, what does it say? It says, these are dirty tears, so I, I can't see where you are. I'm ashamed to ask, but I have to ask, can I start again? Will you carry me back home? I, it's just such a, a beautiful prayer, saying, God, I messed up again. I said I wasn't going to do it, but here I am praying about the same thing. I've messed up again. And when we can know that, he says, instead of shame, I'm going to give you double honor. So that thing that you've done, that shame that keeps coming up, and sometimes shame comes up not because of something that we've done, but something that was done to us. And we experience shame because of it. And it stops us from being fully present. He said, you don't have to deal with that shame anywhere else because when you come with me, I can take that shame from you. And I'm going to take it and I'm going to give you double honor on top of it. I prefer taking my shame there. Brene Brown, who is a shame researcher, you may have watched her TED Talk, one of the most watched TED Talks ever. 
she speaks on shame and vulnerability. And she said, shame cannot survive being spoken. When we speak our shame, it loses its hold on us. And, and she also says that shame cannot survive empathetic connection. So empathetic connection is when I speak my shame and you can relate to my shame, then it loses. Shame is not as shameful anymore. So if I say, if I speak one of my shame, like, you know, just anything. I have a shame story that I share a lot. If I speak a shame, my shame, and you go, you know what, Joanna, I understand. Gosh, that must have been terrible. Mm, and I know what I, I understand what that must have felt like because, you know, when this happened to me, it was, and I and I can tell you now that I wish I had somebody like you to talk to about it because these these things are not nice. But I want you to know that I understand. It's gonna be okay though. You're 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 gonna move through it. That's empathetic. You're empathetically connecting with me around my shame story, around my shame. And when we do that, that's why church can be such a powerful place when we learn how to do this. When we do that and connect with each other in our shame, shame loses its hold. And shame is at the root of most negative emotions, our shame. If you kind of peel away your negative emotions, shame, you'll find shame there at the root of it. But we're... What's the safest place to go offload our shame? Because, I, and we don't know that we can do this. And maybe, maybe we don't know that we can take our shame to God. Because Isaiah 50, 53 and verse 4 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He has borne my shame, your shame. We can take our shame to him. God, today I did not listen to you. I didn't surrender my heart to you when I was dealing with the children. My heart was unsurrendered. And as I am here reflecting on my day, I am so embarrassed about the way I responded when I promised that I wouldn't do it again. God, this shame is really difficult to bear because it was my mistake and I did it. I did that thing that I'm ashamed of today. And I'm mortified and I don't want anybody to find out. And I don't even know how to tell you about it because it's so horrifying. When we can do that, then he reminds us. Because in Isaiah, and I've forgotten the verse that says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of God will lift up a standard against him. And that standard is the word of God. So when we can say that, then Micah 7 verse 9 says, I will bear the indignation of the Lord until he plead my cause and execute righteousness for me. I love that because it's so sweet to me. Because it means that when I do, whatever I do, that mistake that I have to suffer the consequence for, Micah says, Joanna, it's okay. God will be with you. I imagine him sitting in the shame with me saying, I'm going to sit in the shame with you, Joanna. There are consequences for it, but I'm here with you. I'm here with you. And I'm pleading your cause to the Father. But sometimes... When the thing is so powerful and so big and the mistake is so far reaching and it has impact and it impacts other people's lives and we see the result of it, that can hold us captive for a long time. And we can believe that that one is too much for us to release. I know lots of people come into therapy for things like this. Learning how to release the shame learning how to heal it and to move through it and to find a place of peace. But God promised, he says instead of it, he's going to give us double honor. One of the reasons why we don't go, you know, the psychologist says that we're wired, all of us, our nervous system is wired for abandonment, for rejection. We're wired for rejection. You think I'm going to reject you. I think I'm going to reject you. Our nervous system is on high alert for, for rejection. And we believe that God's going to do the same thing, especially when we think we're wrong. That thing was not right. We think he's going to treat us as we are thinking about ourselves. And the shame stops us from being fully there. So we go through the motions. And we miss out on connection. Now, when I think about people, who are some of the people in the Bible who and I'm, and I'm winding up. I'm realizing that we're nearly an hour. Who are some of the people in the Bible who shame should have stopped them from going, but it didn't? 
Who who are some of those people? Shame should have stopped them. Tell me one or two. Shame should have stopped these people, but it didn't stop them. They did some awful things. Jacob, mm, yeah. His whole family. <laughs> Mary, yes. Yeah. Jacob is uh, Abraham and his whole lineage. <laughs> Who else? Because they had dysfunction. Saul. It stopped Saul for a bit. Yeah. Saul, unless you, Saul, who was called David. Absolutely. He was the first one that came to mind. I mean, shame. Th these men should have stopped. You know, I remember in, um, I don't remember, is it Second Samuel? When David numbered Israel and God met him at the threshing floor. And, you know, the, the plague went forth and people were dying. And the man was going to sell, give David a threshing floor. And he said, no. He said, I have to pay for it because this is the price he had to pay. And God said, what do you want? He says, I'd rather fall in the hands of God. Because David knew that God is merciful. And he wants us to know that despite the things that we've gone through and the things that we've done, that he is merciful. He's merciful. And we have to hold on to Micah 7 verse 9 for dear life. Even when we can't believe it, we pray through it still and hold on to it for dear life. I will plead the I will bear the indignation of the Lord until he plead my cause and execute righteousness for me. And not let it stop you from going to him and fully being there. Because nobody else deserves to be there more than you. Nobody. Nobody has any more right to be in his presence than you do. No one. At, because we, we know through Ephesians 2 verse 8, it's by grace that we're saved through faith. And nobody deserves any more grace than you do. So I want you to think about that. So there's the fear, shame, and fear is a big one. Then there's thoughts of not good enough. Then there's feeling like you're, you're not a good enough Christian. And then you can add yours. Add yours to that list. What are the things that stops you from being fully present? So, and some of the things that stops us from hearing his voice, um, mistakes that we've made in the past. And I wanted you to focus on Jeremiah 29, verse 13. Jeremiah 29 and verse 13. Let's read that really quickly. Let's look at what he says in Jeremiah 29, verse 13. You know, I feel like I'm preaching. I'm, I'm supposed to present it. I, I mean, I just love the word of God because it's so, he has a provision for everything there. Jeremiah 29, verse 13 says, and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all of your heart. What's the condition to find in him? What's the condition? What, what's the condition in Jeremiah 29, verse 13 for finding him? What is the condition? With a whole heart. Yes. Yes. Seek in him. Seek in him. And he says, as long as we do that, you'll, you'll be found of us. He never says, you know, when you're perfect, when you fix that thing, when you stop making mistakes, when you fix that mistake, when you're healed, when you're done all that. He says, as long as you search for me, you're going to be, I'm, I'm going to be found of you. Have you ever played hide and seek with children? Who, who plays hide and seek with their children? It's, it's, the, it's the most hilarious thing. Play hide and seek with children. They're so easy to find because they, they, they just, as soon as you go in the vicinity where they are, they're laughing. They're going, Mom, <laughs> it's supposed to be hide and seek. Playing hide and seek with children is hilarious because you will find them. Because they cannot hide for long or their foot is sticking out or their head or they hide in the most amazing places and you, you, that's I just remember that as I as I read Jeremiah 29 verse 13 because he says you're going to find me you know when you seek me with your all of your heart you're going to find me so think think about it like that uh, but one of the things that stops us from seeking in Jeremiah 29 let's look at what stops us from from seeking what stops us? We don't search for him with all of our heart. We don't search for him with all of our heart because it's so divided, dealing with the shame, dealing with fear, thoughts of not good enough, thoughts of being rejected. He's going to reject me. Will he believe me? Why would he do it for me? Who am I? Why would he do it for me? 
despite the evidence, we still question and wonder. And he said, the only, the only condition is that you seek me. So let's look at that. And I repeat that when every other voice is harsh. So what are the other voices also? Notice your thoughts. I want you to, as you learn how to go in God's presence, practice, practice to pay attention to your thoughts. I don't mean give meaning to them. I just learn to hear them. What are the thoughts that comes up? Maybe you can take a note paper. I like to have, I have several notebooks all over the place because I'm always writing. But it helps me because if I'm there and I thought, oh, okay, I've got to call so-and-so today. I need to do this, 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 and this. If I'm in worship in the morning and all of that's going on, when I write it out, it stops it. It silences it. So practice doing that. Practice noticing your thoughts. And noticing what they are, write them down. Is it thoughts of unforgiveness, unforgiving yourself? Is it thoughts of, you know, do you have something against God? Because sometimes we do have things against God. Why didn't you do so-and-so? Why didn't you heal so-and-so? How come you didn't answer my prayer? Our pastor, we just lost our pastor last week. And we prayed, you know, we prayed for him. We had, we had 24 hour praying. We had half night praying. We, we did a lot of praying for him and we still lost him. Um, and so at times like this, I know the intellectual thing that we all spiritualize and said, oh, well, all things work together for good. But really on the ground, it's like, God, I don't understand. I asked, we asked, I told you to return him back to his family. His children are young and they needed him, you know? And so, being honest with those conversations as we go in his presence um, and honestly say, I don't, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. I don't know what you're doing, but I'm going to learn how to trust that what you're doing is the right thing. Okay. And I, Isaiah 59, 55 rather, verse eight, 8 and 9 says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so that's why, you know, some of those have to be brought into subjection. Because even though we question and ask and say we don't understand, when we know him, when we understand him, when we know that he's merciful, we can say, okay, your thoughts are not my thoughts. But help me to bring my thoughts into subjection to yours so that we can, our relationship can continue. Right, so in your own time, in your, on your paper, I'd like you to also use your concordance and find scriptures that reflect God's thoughts about you. What, what are those other scriptures? Some of the things, some of the other stuff that stops us from being present is being present means doing deep self-reflection. And sometimes we're afraid of self-reflection for many reasons. As I said, we are wired for um, rejection, so we think he's going to reject us. Sometimes it's a self-protecting strategy. If I don't self-reflect, then I don't know what I need to do to change. It's a self-protecting strategy. And it's really important to know what's true for you. Then there is shame and then there are negative messages that we get sometimes. And I, and I use this mirror analogy, like if the mirror that you have is broken, when you look in a broken mirror, you're not going to see your face full and clear. You're going to see it in, in, in shattered pieces. And sometimes the mirror that we've been given is broken. The mirror of our past, our family history, painful past learning, negative messages that we've been given. Those are broken mirrors that we're looking through. And when we look through those broken mirrors and see ourselves reflected there, then we think that's how he sees us too. Things like trauma break our mirror. And if we see ourselves through the lens of the trauma, we're not going to see ourselves as good enough to go into his presence, especially when we've developed coping mechanisms that we know are harmful and unhealthy. We think that we're not good enough to go into his presence. Different people develop different coping mechanisms as a result of trauma. There is sometimes a promiscuity. There's sometimes alcohol and drugs and smoking and overworking and um, 
shopping and gambling and the different things that we develop as a result of trauma that we think bar us from going in his presence, the broken mirror that we've been given, painful past learning, the bullying, the shaming, the, the abuse that we suffer at the hands of other people, um, and present disappointment as well, break our mirrors, and feeling unfulfilled like we have an unfulfilled life. We're not, we don't have the things that we think we should or, or the things that we need and we're, we're, we feel deprived in certain areas. Those things shatters, shatters it and shatter how we see ourselves. And sometimes there's so many things that have happened to us. It's very difficult to see or piece together anything that is good about us. Sometimes the view impacts your performance at work, your relationships, the negative messages or the painful past experiences held as evidence that surely God must see you that way. But this is how he sees you. In Ephesians 2 verse 10 gives us an example of how he sees you. It says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God prepared for us beforehand in advance. That's how he sees us. He doesn't see us through the same mirror that we see ourselves. He doesn't use the same one. So you don't have to worry before you go in that these things have happened, will I be okay? He doesn't see us that way. And there's some verses that you, I've asked you to read below that I'm going to kind of let you do that in, in you know, kind of your devotional time. Isaiah 61 verse 3 says, you know, if we're looking through a broken lens, he says, I appoint them that mourn in Zion to give beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called, and I love this bit, trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. That he might be glorified. That's what he says. He says, if you're looking through a broken lens, if you're looking through a broken mirror, and all you can see shattered pieces of you, he says, I created you for good work way in advance, before the trauma, before you were formed in your mother's womb. I created you for good work. And he says, but you know, if life happens to you, Joanna, if life happens to you and it happened to you hard, circumstances that you did not control, mistakes that you didn't make, and it make you and it's making you feel not good enough, not worthy of me, here is what I'm gonna do for you. Isaiah 61, verse 3 says, I'm gonna point those onto them that mourn in Zion. I'm going to give you beauty, Joanna, for ashes. That broken mirror, I'm taking it away. And I'm giving you one that is beautiful. If you think girly, pink, glittery, if you're a girl, and if you think nice, shaved, carved mirror, he says, and it's whole, the mirror can't even be broken again. Because how I see you, I created you for good work. But since life happens sometimes and do these things to you, I'm going to give you beauty for all of that. And in Isaiah 61, verse 7, he says, your shame shall have double honor. And instead of confusion, you shall rejoice in your portion. Therefore, in the land that they shall possess double, everlasting joy shall be theirs. Those are the promises that he made. And you know what, friends? I believe absolutely everything he says. Everything he says. Take him at his word. Take him at his word. I know sometimes we question it. I believe he can manage the question. I believe he can bear the question. There was one day when I was kind of, my relationship with him was growing and I was reading great controversy and I was seeing finally for the first time the role of Jesus in my life. I was in my 20s and I remember one day saying, well, God, well, I understand what Jesus did. He died. I understand the Holy Spirit. He leads me, but what, what's your role? What, what part do you play? And immediately the scripture came to mind. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And I was like, oh, so you were involved in the whole thing. <laughs> because even though I grew up in the church, I didn't have my own connection. He wants to connect with you. He doesn't want, you know, the enemy will want the stuff, the negative messages the painful past learning, the traumas that we've experienced. The enemy will want the stuff to between us and God. He doesn't mind if we go. He doesn't mind if we attend. He doesn't mind if we serve. He minds, though, if we connect deeply 
so that we can have life-changing experiences. That one he doesn't want to happen. So he's inviting us, even if, and I, and I use this prayer a lot, even if you don't know how to do it, to give him your heart, to connect with him, provisions made for everything. And this is in Christ's Objects Lesson, page 159, paragraph 3, that says, Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is thy property to keep. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me, and raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. Isn't that beautiful? See, I don't even have to know how to give my heart. If I don't know how to give my heart, I can just say, can you take it? Because I can't give it. It's yours. Take it. Take, take my heart. Take these thoughts. Bring them into subjection. Take my shame. Replace my mirror. Give me that beauty that you promised me. But help me to learn how to be fully present with you. Because I've, I've not been doing it. And I want to learn how to do it. Thank you for your for, for listening and for your participation.